Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Animal Crossing New Horizons. I'm Nye. Right now in Isle Dechne, it is 3.55 p.m. on Friday, May 1st, 2020. Today is May Day. I hope you'll swing by our resident services to learn about our special May Day tickets. Nook Inc. is giving them out as a way to express their appreciation for our little island community. It'll be amazing. You'll take a trip to a faraway island, get a little R&R, &R, but isn't that why you moved here? Anyway, it's going to be all sorts of fun, so don't forget to speak with Mr. Nook in resident services. That's all for today. Have a fun day out there. You know, I really appreciate it. When someone thinks I don't know how to do my job. It's a fun time. I am going to be ranting just a little bit. Because this one, uh... This one kind of got my dander up a little bit. Not, not going to lie. As many of you may know, I am a, uh... Kind of a technical consultant. Think a little bit of a... A little bit of IT combined with a little bit of, uh... HR. It's my job to work on a program that helps you keep track of your employees, knowing what training they've done, yada yada yada, blah blah blah. You know, nothing amazingly special. Part of what I do is I work for various clients, and uh, they will basically give me their troubles, and it is my job to find a solution. Something's not working? Cool. Let me solve it for you. So one of my clients reached out to me. And they said, hey. This report that we ran. Says that this guy. Is still. Uh, you know, overdue on taking some of his training. But this guy was let go a month ago. What gives? Why does your report not work? That's odd, I thought. I know for a fact that I personally removed that guy from the system last month. So I went and took a look, and lo and behold, that guy was removed from the system last month. Melba, can you get this over with so I can give you a thing? Apparently not. Here, have a thing. So I thought a few moments later, well... That's, that's a bit odd. He's removed, but the report still shows he's in the system. My report must be broken. So I went and looked at the report. Specifically, I looked at the report they gave me, because that's really the important thing. It's the report they were looking at. And then I laughed for a second. I went, oh, I see what's happening. The report they ran, they didn't refresh the report to get new results. The report they ran is still showing results from last month. That makes sense. Their report is from the 30th, and the dude was removed from the system on the 1st. That's why it's just old data. No big deal. Let's let them know. Let's move on. Apparently, this is not how the world works. When I let them know they didn't have to worry about anything, that the data was fine, they just failed to refresh the report, they denied it. We pulled the report today, they said. It can't be wrong, they said. So I went in and I grabbed a screenshot of their report to show them, hey, this is the report you sent me in the email, three emails down this chain. You can go look at it yourself. This is the date on the report, March 30th. The report hasn't been pulled recently. Now, another admin in the systems. So remember, I'm a consultant. I'm from the outside. I don't work for, uh, for this company. Now, that's kind of an important uh, thing to note, is that I don't work for them. So the problem is, is that some of them think I work for them, some of them know that I don't work for them, but because I don't work for this company, there is an unfortunate fact that some of them don't afford me a lot of respect. One of the other administrators, however, reached out and said, hey, by the way, you know, I did just verify, uh, you know, the, the report is working correctly, you just haven't refreshed it lit. And that he also showed them a screenshot. Great, I thought. So that means we're done. We can move on. It's not a problem. Well, no. Money flooring. That's interesting. So, the admin then reaches out to me, says, by the way, I just noticed that they refreshed the port today. report today. Does that mean the report isn't working? And immediately afterwards, the original uh, person who complained 
sent me an email saying, I've been running reports for a year. I know how to run reports. Don't, uh, don't tell me I don't know how to run reports. At this point, I was annoyed. Because now, they're questioning me on whether or not I can read numbers. Now, keep in mind, I questioned them on if they can read numbers, but I showed them screenshots of how they didn't read numbers. I also didn't accuse them of anything. I said, hey, this happened. You know, mistakes were made. It's not a major fault. People don't have to get upset. Except that you made a mistake and move on. But no. Apparently, one second. Sorry, my dog was chewing on something she shouldn't chew on. But no. The person in question decided that because I pointed out a common error, and again, this is common, this happens all the time, that they were going to get their dander up. And another admin who does not admittedly know as much as I do around the system decided to question me on it. So giving credence to the fact that, hey, apparently our consultant doesn't know what he's talking about. So I had to go and log in and I comp on a, onto the user system and look at their report. Yes, it says they ran it today. But I was also able to look at the times the report has last been run. And wouldn't you know it? The report run today was run today. Great. The previous report was run on the 30th, like I thought. 30th of March, by the way, in case you guys are curious. But what was more important is that the, the complaint about the report being incorrect came in at about 10 o'clock this morning. The report was run at 10.15. Lo and behold, it turns out that someone didn't run the report correctly. Or, alternatively, they ran the report correctly and looked at the wrong report. I don't know which happened. It is not my job to pass judgment. I'm not judging in the first place. I am telling you what happened because you asked me what happened. If you don't like my answer, that's fine. But for Christ's sakes, if you're going to challenge the expert on something, please be right. Look, I don't have a problem with being challenged. It's not necessarily professional pride that drives me to rant right now. It, I mean, it is a little bit. I'm going to admit that. I, I really dislike... It, it is a pet peeve of mine. When I know something, because I've put a fair amount of time into note making sure I understand what's going on, it is a personal pet peeve. Uh, if someone uh, proceeds to challenge me on it. The well actually bit is obnoxious in the first place, and people understand this. It's even more obnoxious when you're wrong. The part that bothers me is when people get huffy. Now keep in mind, this is gonna sound this is gonna sound a little bit uh um What's the word I'm looking for? Uh apparently I'm gonna bury this again. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go take care of this in a second. This is gonna sound a little uh hypocritical. But it really bothers me when people can't accept they make a mistake. But when they blame their mistakes on me instead of actually going and looking and saying, hey. Maybe I did make a mistake. In this case, all evidence points to this person did make a mistake here. But instead of actually looking, they just categorically denied it. Look, I've been there. Have done it. I have committed that very same crime myself. Komodo stand. Cool. Uh, I guess that's going to stay here for a bit. Look, I, I, have, I have done that. You know, I have been that person. And I strive to make sure that I do not continue to be that person. But it does it, it does bother me. And especially when someone starts getting in my face about it. I think the big difference is that when I feel like I'm being, you know... Uh, challenged on something and that, you know, my my expertise is being questioned, 
I generally go look and double check my facts. Like that's something that I that I tried to learn a long time ago. Um, I'm trying to see if I still need peaches. I'm checking my notes real quick. Uh, I do not need. Um, you know, some time ago I started making a habit of that when someone says, "Hey, I think you're wrong about that," which that happens a fair amount. Look, I'm not going to profess to any uh, intense level of intelligence, and uh, I get my facts wrong a fair amount. So that's fine. I'll go look up the facts. But I try to, if before I clap back at you with the no, I'm, no, I, I, I do, I go look it up. I go check. And it, so it bothers me when someone doesn't do that. You know, gets in your face about you're wrong, but didn't bother, or, or you're wrong about what you said, but didn't bother to check the details first. Because then you're just wasting everybody's time. But the problem is I work in a professional environment. So it becomes very hard to respond to someone in a professional manner with the, I'm sorry, all the evidence points to the fact that you did indeed make a mistake. It's not a, it's not a judgment on you this happens it's really hard to show conviction and still be able to respond that way and again the big thing you gotta understand is that i'm 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 a professional here like i do work with these people a lot i have a fair amount of work i have to do with them so there you can't just like you get you gotta be you know I mean, look, I'm going to be respectful anyways, but there is a certain level of, like, I can't be snippy about it, you know? Like, no matter how much, you know, how much the other person may ruffle my feathers over, you know, over their attitude, I'm not allowed to show attitude. I don't know, just gets to me a little bit. It's not very often that I have client stories to tell you guys. Um, you know, most of my clients, it's a fairly amicable relationship. I actually had one of my clients chat to me uh, yesterday, actually, uh, about a uh, kind of a silly issue. It wasn't a tremendously big thing. It was just a, it was a, you know, a functionality issue, but it just so happens that I knew, I knew the answer to it. And it was something that after the fact, you know, my client was a little bit more of a, you know, oh, that, you know what, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. I appreciate it. But it was very much, it was it was a silly thing. But afterwards, uh, she said, you know, this is why I'm glad that you're working with us because you're able to get that answer quickly and give me the information I needed. You know, it wasn't, there was none of this immediate defensiveness. Most of my clients are like that. I, I very rarely have an issue like this. But also most of the time, when I work with a client, it's different than the relationship I have with this particular company. Um, this, this particular company is a little bit different from what I normally do. Usually, I work one-on-one -on -one with people. Or, you know, one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with, with, their, with their technical team. So, you know... It's me and the head of their system and maybe three other people, but, uh, you know, kind of all working professionals that all work in the system pretty religiously. And they know the system, but more they know me. Uh, I, I go above and beyond to make sure that if you're working with me, you're going to know me. Uh, and I'm going to know you. That's, that's kind of the point. I need to know you. I need to know your needs. I need to know how you like to work, how you want to be addressed. Are we going to be formal? Are we going to be informal? Uh, are you asking me just to do work, or do you want my opinion? Like, these are all things that I kind of need to know to work for you. Because these questions are going to answer how I work for you. If you don't want me offering suggestions, I'm not going to offer suggestions. Which, unfortunately, means... Uh, hello. What's up, Rockolo? Heard some folks have been calling me Sunflower. 
You really took the way that sounds? You Look, look, boy, you can also call me Sunflower. We are the cool kids, yes. Here, have a thing. Do you get something? You absolutely do. You get some bottom-rimmed glasses. It is absolutely some bottom-rimmed glasses, my dude. There's some weird things they're just fashion accessories. Yeah, I, uh, I also can't... I can't see good. That doesn't look too bad. Oh, got a denim jacket. Neat. Not even an acid wash denim jacket. An actual denim jacket. Ah, nice. Kind of for my comedian's jacket. But, but yeah, I mean, my, my... The work that I do, I tend to be very personalized with how I try to work with people. I, I really value... Um, I, I hear a balloon. I think. Maybe? I really value customizing my work per client, so, you know, talking to them the way they want to be talked. You know, if you're being formal, I will be formal. If you're being informal, I will also be informal. You know, it's kind of based on how you want to talk with me, because I want you to be comfortable. And then I'm going to get to know you. I'm going to get to know how you use the system, uh, what your uh, what your people are like, you know, uh, uh, what type of training you do. Because all of this is kind of necessary information that helps me decide how I'm going to give you advice. Because half the time, that is why, you, uh, why you're asking for the service that I provide is because you want help. Some people, they just want, they need an extra pair of hands. You know, hey, go do this 17 things for me. And it's like, okay, cool, I got you. You don't have to do this. I will do it for you. That And that's what they want out of me. And that's great. That That is what I am here for. Uh, but some people, they do ask for consulting help. They say, hey, we need to, uh, you know, we need to do this, that, or the other thing. We need to set this up this way or this up that way. You know, how, how would you recommend? And so I give a... I get that level of work. So that's how I work with most of my clients. So most of them know if I tell them, hey, I think you might have made a mistake. I think you need to, to check on this. Those clients immediately understand. You know, there's no accusation here. I actually got two completely different people uh, to give me this complaint uh, today that, that a report was not pulling information correctly. Uh, both from the exact same company. Um, one was the person I work with regularly. So, uh, you know, I, I email back and forth with her on pretty much a daily basis. She is the head of the project. Uh, she knows me fairly well. So when I told her, hey, I don't, it, this hasn't been report, refreshed recently. I think that's the issue. She immediately said, oh, <laughs> that makes perfect sense. I see that now. I, I feel silly for bothering you with it. Thank you. And then the other person got offended. Uh, and that tells you everything. The other person is someone that I don't work with very often. They don't know me. So, you know, they got they got defensive on it. I don't really understand why you want why you need to get defensive over something that small. But there you go. Sorry, I had to rant for a second. That that was that actively bothered me. And uh, I needed to I need to vent for a minute. One thing I was thinking about uh, over the past couple of days, and this has come up in a couple of conversations I've had privately with friends uh, on uh, on various, not necessarily asking this question as much as it is this type of topic, but uh, how do you guys label yourselves? What what labels or what identities do you have that are a core component of your character? Or what what factors are key components of who you are as a person? What do you base your um, I'm trying to think of how to word this well? I, I need to move this um this pear tree is not going to work there. I have to move that pear tree. But what a what I, I get, what are the key parts of your identity? I guess is the question. 
This was easier back when we were all in school, right? Because back when you were in school, you were the jock. You were the nerd. You were the cheerleader. You could have been a number of things, but there was always that, you know, that key word, the label, that was what you were known as. But the more I... The more I interact with people on a regular basis, the more I spend time with people, I find that a lot of people tend to have a couple of key terms that they would potentially use to describe themselves. But more, I found people that have had, because of potential issues in the past, there are certain aspects of their identity that define themselves as a person. And that definition of them as a person, I find. Ooh, looking good, Boone. Here, have a thing. I have a number three shirt for you. Wear it in good health. Nice. So there's some things that identify people as a person. So, for example, one of my core identities, because uh, I'm not going to talk to you about, you know, about yours without talking to you about mine, right? The smell of trees and freshly cut grass brings out the adventurer in me. Wandering season is upon us. I'm not sure which I like better, wandering or meandering. I prefer meandering, personally. I'm also fond of rambling. So am I. And Nook Shopping. Please accept our sincere, sincere thanks for your continued patronage of Nook Shopping. We'd like to inform you that we have some wonderful new seasonal offerings in stock. Please take a look when you can. Neat. Okay, so there's KK Step, which is a new song. And this from Mom is Mom's knapsack. Cute. So yeah, I wouldn't ask you guys to evaluate yourselves or even respond to me without telling you about me myself, as usual. So one of my one of my key uh, labels, one of one one of the core concepts of uh, of me as a person, and this shouldn't be uh, surprising, is that I am a gamer. That that's who I am as a person. It really is. If you look at a lot of stuff I do, I spent a lot of my a lot of my time, a lot of my life is spent playing some game or another. You know, it might be Magic the Gathering, it might be League of Legends, Final Fantasy, or Animal Crossing. I play games as a general thing. It is a major part of who I am as a person. Which some people think that's a waste. I disagree. I have met some of my, uh, some of my best friends while gaming. I have spent some of my best times gaming with those same people. Some of my best memories have to do with a video game or a controller or something like that. And not all of these are, are recent. You know, I remember playing, like, Mario while my dad was watching. And I remember part of the reason I remember this is because he could never pronounce the name right. Mario Brothers. But these were these are things that are part of my core identity. And they have become a part of who I am as a person. And it's not just the fact that I play video games, but also that video games have helped decide how I react to various pressures and stimulus in my environment. I've played a lot of puzzle games and a lot of action platformer games and things that in some cases required me to think a little bit outside the box, to not necessarily respond to the world in the way that uh, would normally be expected. You're expected very much in a video game, in a lot of games, to respond to things aggressively. You have an enemy that comes down on you and you are expected to fight them. And you know what? That teaches a decent lesson to people. Especially when it comes to uh, to aggressive threats that are coming your way, and this isn't just in a uh, in, in a in a potential uh, situation where um, you know a villain is coming at you. We're not just talking about a mugger coming at you. It's talking about any such threat in your life. And threats don't have to be, uh, they don't have to be physically dangerous. It's talking about things like potential unemployment, 
how you respond to that. It's talking about how you respond to uh, a weaker economy. It's talking about how you respond to uh, a potential uh, storm or something like that. It's, it's any possible thing that exists out there in the world that threatens you, your way of life, and your, uh, and your mental and physical well-being. Threats come in all kinds of different shapes and forms. And one of the things I learned by playing video games is that sometimes the best way to handle such a threat is to stand up to it. Not necessarily to fight it. You don't have to get aggressive, you don't have to get physical. But to stand up to it, to resist it. A lot of these types of uh, things, you can resist them. They don't need to be... Um, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of having no space. I'm going to put this stuff away and we'll pull it out later. But you don't have to be willing to lay down, roll over, or give up when something terrible comes your way. You don't necessarily have to give in either. And I think that's a really important point to some people. When you're being, you know, bullied, for example, is one of the most amazing examples. If you have a bully in your life, you don't have to just live with it. You don't have to let them do their thing. There are ways that you can respond to it and ways that you can make sure that they will not continue to do so, which typically involves standing up to them in some way, shape, or form. So one of the things I learned very early on is that sometimes you do have to stand up and understand that you will have to potentially fight for something. You will potentially have to resist in some way. You might have to be a little bit uncomfortable in order to make sure that the thing that you care about ceases to exist. And the thing that's threatening you ceases, or the thing you care about continues to exist. The thing that's threatening you ceases to exist. That does happen. But if we look at games like Ori and the Blind Forest, one thing I also learned through video games, and many video games at that, is that not every threat that you face has to be dealt with with violence. In fact, I would wager that many threats that you face do not have to be dealt with with violence. You don't have to aggressively respond to all threats, to all issues. Sometimes, it's plenty good to just move around them. Just to avoid them. That's all you have to do. You don't have to go in, and you don't have to fight, and you don't have to, you know, be angry. You can just say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going away from this. I'm going to, you know, move around, or I'm going to leave this behind me. But in some way, shape, or form... This is not going to be something that I'm going to allow me, or allow to, to threaten me. I'm just going to sidestep. But also, gaming is something that I learned allows me to exercise. I play, I play Dance Dance Revolution, and Dance Dance Revolution is decent exercise. It's probably not as good as some other things, but if you can do Dance Dance Revolution for a good hour or so... I imagine that's at least got to be good as Jazzercise, right? I've worked up heavy sweats playing that game, because I don't take it easy. I play on higher difficulties, and I go, go, go. And that helped me find ways that I can exercise that works for me. Now, that's not to say that's the only exercise I do, and that's not to say that that is the only healthy exercise. It absolutely isn't on either, uh, on either one of those two. But it absolutely is a way that I can get into it, and it's helping me get better at exercising. Gaming also helps me to just pass time. I might be riding my bike, and I will bump up someone like the Game Grumps or something like that on my phone as I'm riding, and I'll just listen to them. And that helps me lose track of time. That, and that helps me, again, to exercise. Because I'm not paying attention to the burn of my muscles or to the amount of time that's passed. I'm enjoying listening to them goof off and do stupid shit. So one of the core aspects of my personality, one of the things that... One, one, one of the one of the basic tenets to me as a person is that I'm a gamer. Another core aspect of my personality that I'm aware with is that I'm a teacher. I love to teach. 
you guys have heard me talk about it, talk about how I love to love to help people learn something. I love to watch people learn. I love to learn myself, but I love teaching people. I enjoy the feeling of watching someone take a concept that was difficult for them to begin with and to be begin to understand and to master. Now, unfortunately, the downside there is that that's not always a good thing. Sometimes I take the role of teacher when I really shouldn't, when I really should just kind of not be doing that. Because sometimes people don't want to learn. Sometimes taking on the guise of pedagogue is a bad thing. And sometimes it feels like you're talking down to people. People get upset at that. So being a teacher, being a, you know, being that influence is not always a positive thing. But it is a core aspect of my personality. When I hear someone not that doesn't understand something, when they're when they're struggling with something, my first instinct is to reach out if I understand what it is and try to help. Now on a more negative side of things, and I'm aware this is there, but it's taking it, it, it's really hard for me to it's a real struggle for me to get away from this. But one of the core aspects of me is lack of education. It bothers me a fair bit that when I was a lot younger, I made a lot of very stupid mistakes. And one of them is that I dropped out of school. And there was a lot of stuff I didn't learn that I wish I did. And I've been struggling to, you know, make up for it, to try to look for ways to get the education back. But right now, college isn't an option, so I kind of have to just do independent research and go look stuff up or ask people who know more than I do. But it's something that I'm constantly... Uh, I thought I heard a balloon. It's something that I am constantly... Um, I did hear a balloon. It's something that I am constantly compensating for. Always seeking to make sure I know the answer. And part of that has to do with, again, that kind of aspect of teacher, with wanting to wanting to teach and wanting to. Uh huh. Okie dokie. That present is just gone. So part of it has to do with the, the, the concept of being a teacher, because you can't teach if you don't know. So learning is kind of an important thing there. But I'm always concerned that I just do not know enough, that I am surrounded by people who are more intelligent or better learned than I am. And I have to rise up to equal them, to contribute into a conversation or contribute uh, into kind of any given situation. That's not always a good thing. In some cases, it causes me to sound like a know-it-all when really I'm trying to, trying to prove that I'm just not a know-it-nothing. But that is kind of a core part of my personality. And I see a lot of people who have other parts of their personality that are core to them. One primary example, or well, two examples, really, that I'll give that are core personality, uh, core labels for a lot of people, especially lately, are gender and sexual orientation. Because you'll notice that when I commented about things that are core to me, my gender or who I'm attracted to is not actually part of it. I don't consider that personally to be something that is a major defining feature of me as a person. But I do have friends who think otherwise. I have friends who the fact that they are gay is a major part of them. If you were to ask them to define themselves in five words or less, gay would be one of those major words. And if you're curious what I mean, go look up some people on Twitter. Go look up Twitter profiles and go look at that very brief bio, the three lines, 18 words that they use to tell you everything about themselves. They might tell you their job. They might tell you that they're a parent. Oh, yes, yeah, she said a thing. 
Okay. Well, that... Okay. Quest done. Uh, I don't have anything for you. I will talk to you later. But they'll tell you that being a parent may be the thing. But a lot of them, at least in some of the circles that I follow, it's gender or sexuality. Now, generally, what I see is that when it's sexuality, it's because they are explicitly not heterosexual. They are bisexual, or they're homosexual, or pansexual, or any of the other actuals that live out there. And it's a major part of it's a major part of them, and they need you to know that. And generally, when I see gender involved, it's because there's something big going on there. They might be an ally trying to uh, help with uh, with some of their transgendered friends and make sure they know, you know, hey, I will also give my pronouns. I will also give my gender. It may be someone who, you know, who is transsexual, and they need to make sure you know who and what they are from the get-go. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But I'm interested in who defines themselves in what way. Because different people define themselves in different ways. They have different methods of saying and identifying. These are the core things that are important about me. And I always find it, as I said, interesting. You owe me a peach lassie? Okay, cool. Here, have a thing. Uh, a retro radiator. Yes, that is a retro radiator. Congratulations. Okay, so you're gonna give me a bathrobe. Okay. So what interests me about this first and foremost, about this topic of conversation, is I, I'm just interested in people. I'm interested in what people feel are the most important things about them. Because generally I feel different. About both myself and about the people in question. I've got a friend of mine who is very down on their looks. And because they're down on their looks, they don't believe that they can be cute. But in my eyes, cuteness in a very big way is more about your personality and how you interact with folks than it is about what you look like. I know people who... They're not going to be on the cover of any modeling magazines anytime soon, as much as I would hate to tell them that to their faces. But goddamn are they the cutest people I know. The most cuddly, interesting, loving people that I know. But it's not a label they would ever give to themselves. And it was a big deal a number of years ago when people were saying, I don't fit in any labels. And that is complete total bullshit, because the label you just put yourself on is no labels. Everybody has a label or two. Everybody. Without question, without exception, everybody has a couple. And that's not a bad thing. Just because we can identify a couple of aspects of you and your personality by just a couple of words does not mean they're a negative thing, and it doesn't mean that you're a simple person. It just means it's easier for other people to know, hey, you're going to make a good match for me. If you were a, let's say, maternal person. Mountain bike, tricycle, outdoor hat. Da, 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 da. KK Tango. Let's go ahead and grab that. Is it... It said Nook Shopping has fe special stuff. Is it under Nook Miles? Not a 100% sure what shopping he was talking about. Maybe maybe it was maybe it was Timmy and Tommy. Let me check the letter again. We are going to deal with label. Don't forget, don't worry. I will go talk to her in a minute. Please, I person sincere thanks for continuing to patronage of Nook Shopping. We'd like to inform you that we have some wonderful new seasonal offerings in stock. Please take a look when you can. Nook 
shopping. Oh. I didn't even realize there was a second tab here. And we got a Mother's Day. Thank you, Mom Mug. Neat. Okay. One of the reasons this came up is that a friend of mine was questioning. I'm trying to remember. Oh, he was questioning Animal Crossing. Several of us in a voice call were uh, making uh, comments on uh, Flick and CJ. And for those of you who haven't been following Twitter, or haven't been following uh, general uh, comments about Animal Crossing as of late, a number of people have decided that Flick and CJ are boyfriend and boyfriend. Now, there's a lot of information that they put forward to, uh, you know, to make this, um, to make this statement. Part of the fact is that, uh, Flick and CJ refer to each other as partners. Part of the fact is that they refer to as roommates. And in, uh, Animal Crossing, typically, when people are partners in Animal Crossing, when they refer to each other as that, it only happens a couple of times, and it's usually because they are actually together romantically. And in a game where everybody has their own house and lives alone, living with someone, kind of a thing. Now... The, uh, apparently the translation in Japanese is that they are friends. It's a completely different thing. And the official Nintendo guide refers to them as business partners. But a lot of people ship it. A lot of people go, you know what? Ah, we are, he already has all the fossils. Damn. So a lot of people, you know, a lot of people ship it. They feel that they would make a really cute couple. And I'm going to be honest. I've looked at a lot of the fan art, and there's some damn cute stuff in there. Like, I, I, you know what? I'm all aboard. Flicking CG all the way. But this friend of mine was kind of, uh... Annoyed isn't the word, but he was kind of bothered by the fact that this was important to people. That they were or were not together. And he just couldn't understand why we were all talking about it, or why we all were considering it. Good bathroom. And it took several of us, those of us who either, you know, have friends who are gay or otherwise, or those of us who are, it took several of us to point out that there isn't really a lot of... I mean, the word is representation. That's what everybody says. Everybody uses that word, representation. But there's not a lot of representation of homosexual folks in video games or in TV or in movies. And one thing that everyone wants, and you might not admit this to yourself, but think about it for a minute and you will agree. One thing everybody wants I do know how to make a tea table. Okay, well, we got another recipe we already have. One thing, one thing that just about everybody wants is they want to see people like themselves represented in media. This is not isolated down to just sexuality or gender. I should go talk about... Yeah, we'll, we'll go look at Mayday. But this is not isolated to sexuality or gender. Absolutely not. In a lot of movies, we want women to be in the movies. Not just women in general. Not just as side pieces. Not just as eye candy. We want actual strong female characters. We want women who are real women. Who, you know, are in there. We want our superheroes to actually include women. We want our uh, action heroes to include women. 
It's an important thing, because women can also do that stuff. We want men to be able to, to be in movies in the more uh, paternal role. You know, we want the single dads. We want that stuff. We want to see not just white faces. We want black faces, and we want, uh, you know, we want African Americans, we want Latinos, we want uh, Asians, we want uh, people from the Middle East. We want everybody in. We want movies from everywhere. We want people to be in there because, number one, it is important that people like you are on screen. That's always going to be an important thing. It's not just because of political correctness or anything like that. In fact, I would say it's not because of political correctness at all. It's actually, I, I think it's a completely separate thing. I wouldn't necessarily say opposite. Um, I'd almost say opposite, though. It's not because of that. It's because you want to be validated. You want to know that... Probably not the decisions you've made. Decisions is a really hard word when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Because some of the stuff is decisions. You know, me being a gamer, the decision in a big way. But a lot of the stuff that are, uh, that are you, like specifically you, you as a person... A lot of the stuff is not stuff that you decide, it's stuff that you become. Someone who is nurturing. I wouldn't necessarily say they decided to be that way. It's just what they are. And people want to see people like them. It's an, it's an amazing thing. I remember... Um, I remember listening to, uh, I think it was uh, David Sedaris in one of his uh, albums about Christmas. And he was working as an elf in a uh, Christmas village. And... Sup? Hi, Peanut. I have a thing for you. I don't know what it is I'm going to give you, but... Here, have Rose Wall. Printed layered shirt. Yeah, I do love those. Apparently, I get them all the time. What's up, Sable? Any plans for the weekend? I'm going to play video games. Thought I'd get some sewing in, try to get jump on next week's work. Oh, poor Sable. Workaholic. Makes it harder to get all my work done. I love cloudy weather. Fight the gloom by only using the brightest colors I can find. Remember he was talking about working uh, the front of the line where they had, you know, five or six Santas. Uh, so that way they could take care of uh, all of the all the kids that were coming up. And uh, whoops. And you know they had they had a white Santa, they had a black Santa, they had a Santa to try to fit everybody. But if the line wasn't moving well enough, they would just kind of give you whoever was available. And uh, a family came up and uh, suit of light. So I can't wait to see that. I was re I'm really hoping for a full top hat at some point. But a family came up to him and told him that uh, they wanted someone like them. Now, that's an important thing, because it does beg the... It, it, now, keep in mind, his, his story ends very differently from the way mine will. But that's an important thing. If you're a... If you're a black family, I have to imagine... Now, please, correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be wrong. But I have to imagine your kids probably imagine a black Santa, because that's what they're used to. That's their community. That's their family. And Santa's a very family figure. And that should be represented. There should be someone like you. I guess it's based on culture, and it's based on expectations, but... You know, that's what I would figure. And I might be wrong, and if I am, you can go ahead and correct me. But that's what I would figure, is that... Oops, okay. Well, apparently we're wearing this outfit. But you, you, you would want people of the same labels as you to be representing you. If someone... 
Not 100% sure what makes this of lights. But when someone's on, you know, on screen, on on the TV, or on, you know, on, on a movie, and they are a quote-unquote gamer. I don't want to watch that movie and see that just every gamer in every movie is a loser. It's not true. That's not how people are. People are not just losers. Like, they're, they're different. I don't want to see every jock as the really good-looking guy. Or alternatively, I don't want to see every good-looking guy is a jock. Because that's not true. There are good-looking people who are not jocks. There are really good-looking people who are nerds. Look at Vin Diesel. Yep, let's do the exercise. What's my theme today? Let's do it. A party outfit. Okay. Ooh, a fancy soiree. Cool. What party clothing are you going to give me? A young royal shirt. Oh, okay. Okay, well, let's go figure this out. But we don't really want to see, we don't want to see typecasting. We don't want to see generalizations. We want to see realistic people. And so the problem is, is that in a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases, people who are transgendered in uh, these shows or movies, or people who are homosexual in these shows, movies, or bisexual in these shows and movies, they're shown to be filling a very specific role. I very often see gay men as shown as very uh, slutty. Like, they just want to sleep with literally everyone. Uh, they have the morals of an alley cat in heat. Extremely effeminate. And again, we're talking about things that are just not... not accurate to real life. I know extremely, like, masculine gay men. They just happen to be into men. I have a bunch of lesbian friends who are not dressing all in flannel. Like, these these are, you know, common stereotypes, but they're not really true. And we need to not be necessarily showing them that. We need to see actual people who are actually real people in reality. You wouldn't necessarily want every woman in every, uh movie to be just Susie Homemaker, you know, because it's not a realistic interpretation of that audience. So you kind of want to see, you know, a certain level of realism there. And the problem is we don't necessarily get that. So one of the things that makes, um, okay, hold on. We got to actually, I got to actually pay attention real quick. I got to dress, dress up, dress the nines, right? Okay. So doublet, uh, I need flashy slacks. I, I could run with that. Do we have... Could go with the slacks. I'm thinking, I think we're going to go with the, the flashy slacks. I gotta go look at the suit of lights and see what that's actually supposed to be. I want a top hat, damn it. Oh, apparently I have two small silk hats. Okay. We got some duplicates in here I gotta get rid of. Well, it doesn't really, uh... Give me much I can wear on my head. For... You know what? Nah. We'll just go with this. Ah, uh, let's see. Where are my gilly brogues? There they are. Cool. Lost track of what I was saying. You just, you, we really want to see people. Here. Well, okay, and and that, that's what that's why some of the community will kind of aggressively ship certain 
you know, pairings because they make for a good pairing that is actually somewhat realistic. I have changed clothes. You can absolutely take a look. Sure. You see? Yes. This is what I mean when I say I'm looking for a party style. Fantastic. What a superb combination of pieces. You express the theme beautifully. I've learned so much. Thank you. I'm going to send a thank you gift to your home. Remember to use Taylor's tickets at the Taylor shop. And please take this too. I made it with my own two paws. What do you give me today? Ooh, we got glasses. It's another design for my label. Or, sorry, for my label. Some LaBelle sunglasses. I hope you like the style. New design I just finished. I'm planning to have that sold at the Taylor shop. Looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you for being so very helpful. Okay, let's check these out. Oh, hell yes. I dig it. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I hear very often people will ship and they'll one true pairing and all that good stuff. But there are some of these that just kind of stand out as being very well done. And I think that's one of the reasons why, like, Flick and CJ work so well. Is that they're just two fairly normal guys. Yeah, Flick is a little bit out there with some of his uh, some of his thoughts on bugs. Sure, you know he does have a little bit of that. Uh, you know, try to think of the words here. He does have a little bit of that um, eccentric artist thing going on, but. In general, he's just a dude with a hobby he's seriously into. And I've met those dudes. I've seen guys that do that with Warhammer figurines. I've seen guys that do that with books. I've seen people that do that with art. There are people who are hugely into that stuff. And, you know, would, would go way off on people uh, for their target, you know? And CJ is effectively a YouTuber or effectively a Twitch streamer. He just happens to do it on fishing, which, you know what? Cool. I'm not particularly into fishing myself, but I know a lot of people who are. One of my uh, one of my friends, or at least uh, or at least acquaintances, uh, is uh, potentially going fishing this weekend. He's been looking forward to it for a while. Okay, fishing is fishing is neat, and that's and that's CJ's thing. Is he? What does CJ do? CJ fishes. That is his, uh, that is his thing. So, in general, Flick and CJ are just ordinary guys. And the, uh, the assumption is that they're ordinary guys who happen to be seeing each other. And I think that's the thing that makes that ship so spectacular. That potentially makes it, you know, fantastic. Is that... Okay, apparently we're just gonna put that there. I think that's what makes this ship fantastic, is that they are ordinary. That, you know, it's not something special. It's not being gay that defines them. They're defined by other traits. If you ask someone who uh, who looks at this game, you know, what what is special about Flick, they're going to talk about bugs. They're not going to talk about, you know who his partner is, necessarily. And I know not everybody necessarily agrees that CJ and Flick are together. You know, that was the, the start of this conversation. But you're going to have people who are going to say, you know, CJ's about fish and Flick's about bugs. So having people that kind of fit... And I'm not going to say lifestyle, either, because I don't think that's... I don't think that word applies here. But having people that, you know, are, you know, upfront about having... That per uh, that um not personality but uh that uh that sexuality having them be just folks is such an important thing. Do I do I want now we're gonna do barbed wire fencing barbed wire fencing for uh for Bruce it fits for Bruce and if necessary I'll take down his fencing so I can uh give it to Silvana. But it's it's certainly an important thing that I think that uh that this individual the the friend that I had this discussion with didn't quite understand. But you know there's there's definitely other things. I remember when I was uh 
when I was hiring for GameStop, I was hiring for a uh, third key manager one day. And uh, one of the guys I was hiring for was ex-military. You know, spent some time in Iraq. Um, you know, came back. And uh, one of the questions I was asking him is, is there anything that he wanted me... Uh, no, I can't put that there. Was there anything he wanted me to know about himself? Or anything extra he wanted to add? And he had mentioned that a lot of people, when they, when they hear about... You know, ex-military... What they what they hear in a big way is, uh, you know, they hear post traumatic stress disorder. They hear, um, you know, they hear grunt who can only take orders and can't think for himself. Uh, they hear someone who will do a lot of manual work, and that's that's all you can really count them count on them for. And it's that same thing. I know a lot of people who define themselves by the fact they were that they were military. It's something that they are proud of. Uh, which honestly, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't be. That being military is a huge thing to be proud of. You you put it all on the line for other people. That's a no matter no matter what country you come from. You know, you literally dedicated literally your life. You you uh, put your life on the line in the pursuit of the interests of your country folk. And that is a that's a tremendously big deal and it always will be. But I remember him being worried that he was going to be not necessarily judged by the fact that he was military. But he was worried that decisions would be made by that ex-military fact that wouldn't necessarily be in his favor. Oh, hello. That's new butterfly. Come here, you. Got a great purple emperor. As I said, that one's new. I forgot. We are officially in July. Sorry, July. Officially in May. So a bunch of uh, stuff's available this month. check something. Did I ever get a... Uh... I think tarantulas are out. So I've heard. Yep, tarantulas ended in April. Did I ever get... Hold on. Yeah, I did get an Emperor Butterfly. Just looking at this going, I know I caught that. So we got a lot of, a lot of stuff I can start, uh, start catching. Got a bunch of fish I can catch still. I'm gonna have to go look at that. The labels that we define ourselves as. I've been waxing on and on about labels for literally the past hour, so I think now is a fantastic time for me to stop such foolishness. So as such, I'm gonna go ahead and say goodbye. Now, I do wanna hear uh, work stories. Um. So if you guys have any fun work stories, uh, you know, the customer is not always right sort of things, or even just nonsense that happened in work, uh, do let me know. I'm going to be checking the comments. And I also do want to know, what, what labels are important to you guys? Oh, not fossils. Um, what labels are important to you guys? How do you define yourselves? You know, if you could describe yourselves in five words or less, how would you do so? I am very curious. I want to learn more about this one, yes. In that case, the Great Purple Emperor lives high in the treetops and is renowned for its pretty purple-hued wings. Its impressive bird-like wingspan and elusive nature have made it a favorite among butterfly aficionados. But truth be told, the so-called Great Purple Emperor has some not-so-great personal peculiarities. For one, it has two horrid horns upon its head when it is in its caterpillar form, and it has been known to dine on feces and animal carcasses. That's why I call it the Emperor of Ew. As usual, if you could do me a favor and 
know, comment if you can, but also do me a favor and put a like on the video. Uh, that does make it so my videos show up more often for other people. So if you liked this, it means that other people are more likely to see it. Also, awesome rain. I've got to check something really quick before the hour changes. Run! I always forget to be here on time. Damn. Got to be here at the turn of the hour one time. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you if you like, it does make it more likely that people are going to see this. So if you liked it, hopefully we can get to other people. And then if you want to see more content, please subscribe. It absolutely helps me out. Uh, it means you're going to see my stuff go up when it goes up. I upload one or more videos a day. And if you want to see com uh, st content live, I do stream uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. And possibly even on other days, though that's more subject to personal whim and whimsy. You can see my alerts either on YouTube, or alternatively, you can go into my Discord channel, which is in the description of the video, and join up there where I announce. It's been a pleasure talking to you folks, as usual. I will see you tomorrow.